outside, so it's getting a bit chilly. <laughs> so are you from there? Middle all night. Where are you from? Middle Tennessee, originally. Oh. Yeah. All right. Okay. Great. I've never been to Tennessee. I don't. I. I don't think. I've been to what? Memphis. No, I've been to Memphis. Yes, one time. You got to come back. You got to. You got to hit up the Nashville area. Yeah, I know. I should do. I, you know, now that I have a friend there, I'll. I'll visit. <laughs> please, please, by all means, we welcome you with open arms. <laughs> I appreciate that. All Socially right. distance, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm tired of that too, Sherry. Sherry of no. course. Well, welcome, hey, to, your, welcome and, to the big app. In three seconds, because I, I think I'm having sound problems, but uh, let's try this. Uh, Are you having it with me? No, oh, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's me. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Movie Reviews and More. Anyone that knows me knows how special our guest is to me today. He is a, um, I hold him in very high regard. He is the best-selling author of his memoir, From the Projects to Profiles, he, which has been the centerpiece of my wall of fame behind me. Um, <laughs> Mickey Burke, he is a true American success story. One that was built on hard work, determination, and the will to get where he is today. He is the proud holder of two Emmy Awards, five Telly Awards, and one of the most successful talk shows on TV. Mickey Burns proves that kindness and charm never goes out of style because his show has become a mainstay for millions of people for the last 20 years. It is with great honor to welcome into your living room and our living room, the great Mr. Mickey Burns. Sherry, it's, a hey, it's a pleasure to be on your show. I love your show. I watch it all the time. You do a great job. And I consider it an honor, honor to be part of it this evening. <laughs> Thanks, Mickey. We just appreciate you coming back with us. You've already been with us before, and, and we're so happy to have you back with us. And thank you for taking of your time to spend Absolutely. with us as well. First we appreciate that. Thank you. One of my favorite interviews when I was first uh, releasing the book, and it was they did a great job, uh, Sherry and Brian. So um, I'm looking forward to this one as well. Well, speaking of books, per your yeah. last interview, I, a, a little birdie as yourself said that you've got another one coming up possibly in November. Well, I'm glad you asked. Because, <laughs> uh, let me tell you the back. Can I tell you the backstory to the Please. book? Please. Please do. During the, during the pandemic, we had some downtime. And one day, I, I have the same photographer who's been on the set of Profiles. We've just finished 500 episodes. Wow. Uh, but he's, he, he's been on the set for, with me for 20 years. So one day uh, in the spring, the pandemic just started. His name is Robert. And I said, Robert, how many photos have you? I'm just curious. Have you taken in 20 years on the set, in and around the set of profiles? And he said, that's a good question. I have no idea, but I'm gonna go home tonight, look in the computer, I'll call you tonight with a number. So he calls me that evening, he said, Mickey, I have 14,542 photos. <laughs> wow. In and around the so I said, you're kidding me. I said, oh my God, what a, that's enormous body of work you did. So I called up our publicist who called up our book, pub, uh, our, our book publishing company. And within a week, they said, you have to do a, uh, a coffee table book. So we started working on it in the spring. And because of the pandemic, we had a lot of downtime. And we completed it uh, recently. And it's due for a November release. And what it is is a uh, overview of this series in photos with quotes from the interviews and fun facts of the, the celebrities that we're featuring How in the book. How fun is that? That is awesome. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yay. Mickey Burton, you know what? I, with your longevity and the great success of your show, you could almost make a board game out of it, a trivial pursuit <laughs> game. I'm going to put you in charge of that. <laughs> I appreciate that. And inter interestingly, when we started going over these 14,000 plus photos, what memories it, it brought back for me, because I had forgotten about a lot of the celebrity behind the scenes and things like that. 
And I, I was seeing a lot of these photos for the first time, believe it or not. Wow. Mickey, um, Mickey I, I wonder if we could do something with you. Um, think of your neat jerk fondest memory if I ask you about a few people, okay, from your show, and maybe they're in your new book. Um, Absolutely. So my first one is Dick Cavett. Well, Dick Cavett, I, it was an idol of mine. <laughs> and when I started my career as a talk show host, I always felt he, he kind of set the template for intelligent conversation on television. He was the master. And, and he gave me a great tip because he was a fan. He's a fan of profiles. He says, I watch every episode. And, and he said, he felt the reason that the show was doing well and was a success was because I was following his golden rule as a, an interviewer. And that is always be yourself. Don't, he called me, don't. interviewers, a lot of them make the mistake of trying to be somebody else. Be yourself, create your own brand, and you'll be great. And, and I, what a compliment coming from, in my opinion, a king of, of, of talk show hosts. Well, well, yeah, and Mickey, sorry, I'm going to go to my next one, but you give comfort, especially now when we need it. You are our safe haven of trust. You know, like we welcome you to our living room. So, you know, you're a blessing. Well, thank <laughs> okay. you so much. Who else you got? Chuck Barris. Well, Chuck Barris is the reason, believe it or not, Jerry, that I wrote the first book. Oh. <laughs> you know, he was one of my... I, I loved him on the gong show. Yeah. But he was also a, hi, how are you? There's somebody new. Uh, yeah, I um, I was having technical difficulties. This is Terry Marie out of Redondo Beach, California. Uh, Sound perfect. Yeah, so <laughs> sorry that Let I me... was uh, joined the late. Okay. So I'm going to finish my Chuck Barris story. Yeah. So what I learned from Chuck Barris is you got to be, think out of the box. Because when he wanted to get into broadcasting, he didn't know what to do. But somebody said, you know, if you want to get it, your foot in the door, become an NBC page. Oh. All right. Wow. So, so what he did was he said, well, there's a thousand people trying to get, get in there. They only take like five a year. So he went to the library and looked up who was on the board of directors of, uh, of NBC. And he used those seven or eight names as his references. And he said, <laughs> no. he said Mickey, they never check. <laughs> he became one of the five <clears throat> that they chose. He also wrote a song uh, called Palisades Park back in the 60s, which was, I think, number three nationally. And we talked about that. He was unable to continue writing songs because he ended up working for NBC and ABC, and they thought it was a conflict of interest. It was during the pay, time of payola. But he stopped, Sherry, he, uh, he stopped me in the middle of, of the interview and said, Mickey, you have a book in you. Oh. And I said, wow. I said, well, I, I said, Chuck, I'd never have the time to do this, you know? He said, I got a tip for you. Write one page a day, and at the end of the year, you have your book. So I tried. <laughs> On a rainy Saturday afternoon, I start, sat down with a, uh, in a, by the type, typewriter and I started to write the first chapter. But I couldn't take his advice because I couldn't write one page. When I started <laughs> writing seven or eight, ten, twelve pages. But because he inspired me to do so, Chuck Barris is, was the inspiration behind it. One last Chuck Barris and we'll move on, Jerry, to the next one. Every guest, my last question has always been, what do you hope your legacy will be? Chuck didn't hesitate. And he said, I want it written on my tombstone, gonged at last. <laughs> <laughs> he passed away, That's great. He passed away five years ago. And I read in the New York Times, that's exactly what's on his tombstone. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he okay. did it. He did it. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, um, let's get it on. But I, I, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry, Leslie Caron. Well, Leslie Caron was, was such a mega star, but yet in person, she was very, very modest. 
and she had just won an Emmy for a role she played as a rape victim on Law and Order. But we talked about how Warren Beatty wanted to marry her in the worst way. But she said he was too controlling, too much drama. So she had come from France after World War II to star in some of the biggest musicals in Hollywood. And I said to her, as you came to the United States, did your mother give you any advice before you left her and came to Hollywood? She said, just one piece of advice. Whatever you do, don't marry Mickey Rooney. (laughs) (laughs) And and she didn't. uh, But I found her to be still beautiful. I don't know. She was like 70 something years old at the time. Uh, Intelligent and a a really sweet person. Wow. (laughs) And she didn't. My last one. (laughs) All worried. My last one, Joan Rivers. Wow. Uh, We really miss her. A lot of people don't realize how smart she was. She was the valedictorian of her college uh, senior class. She got, she had a degree in anthropology. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, But, but the last time I had her on, unfortunately what killed her was the operation uh, that she went in for nodes because she was having horse horse problems. Uh, but I asked her one time, you know, I said, geez, last time I had her on, should I ask her about her plastic surgery? You know? So I said, Joan, you know, as a lot has been written about your plastic surgery. I understand you've had a few procedures. And boy, she went on and she said, yeah, I had my nose done, my lips done, the liposuction, breast in, uh, reduction, this, that. And she was very honest about it. She had no problems talking about it and, and being out, out front and honest. Uh, she, she was the best, and, and, and it's a shame uh, she, should, she should still be with us today. But people don't realize how smart she was. She was also a great talk show host, and she won many daytime talk show. I really, I always really admired her. I mean, I could tell that she was, you know, a smart cookie, um, but she's somebody, you know, growing up watching her, I just, I just always loved her. She's great sense of humor. You can tell that she was down to earth. You know, right. it came through, not even knowing it, it just came through that she was, you know, a genuine person. She was the best. And then I remember the first interview, I remember she stopped the interview. She said, Mickey, you're really a good interviewer. And I, and it, it just made my hell, my head swell up. But she was such a good interviewer. <laughs> what a nice compliment coming from her, you know. And I said to her, John, what did you expect? You know, we, <laughs> we wouldn't bring you here otherwise. <laughs> But it turned out great, and I miss her terribly, as do many other people. Mickey, we just lost um, Joe Morgan. Got a favorite member? Oh. Do I have a on on whom? Uh, Joe Morgan, baseball player. I didn't. I didn't have. Joe. I never had him on my show. Oh. I had Joe Montana on my show, the four-time Super Bowl champ. Yep. And boy, do I have a memory of I him. remember that one. <laughs> remember that story? Yes. About the, we, we ate his dinner by accident. So I good. Laughed. When, I, when I heard that on the last interview, I just laughed out loud. <laughs> I, I thought that exactly was something that I would do. It was like, wow, for <laughs> me, thank you so much. And then just. <laughs> just to summarize it, we ate his dinner by accident. And uh, we didn't know until he showed up and somebody told us that. But the moral to that story is never assume anything. You know, we, <laughs> for us, why it wasn't. So to be reflecting back, I remember very little about the interview, but I remember the fallout from eating his dinner extremely uh, well. You know, that's a funny story. Mickey, was- Mickey earlier uh, Sherry said that it was. Oh, go ahead, Jess. Go ahead. Uh, uh, earlier, Sherry said that um, it was a comforting. You were just a comfort to us and, and a comfort to bring you into our living rooms. And I, just to kind of elaborate on that, um, even though I am in Tennessee right now, I was living in New York City for a while. And oh. having, and it's been a blessing um, to, to be away and be out in the nature and, and kind of be away from all the all the crazy. However, I do miss it pretty often. And, um, and just hearing you, first of all, I could listen to you talk all day. I love your voice, but also your accent. Yes. It just, 
I I love it. It's so great. And it makes me feel kind of like I'm kind of back back in the city. So I appreciate that. And also you mentioned in the first interview that you had, um, cause Sherry touched on your accent as well. And you said, oh, there's a story behind that. And it's something you've been trying to kind of, you've, you've kind of well, dealt with your whole life, but, but you didn't actually go into detail about that. So. Yeah, yeah. I just think when I do the interviews, I, I have less of an accent. I've been able to train myself to pronounce my ERs and my PHs. So when now I'm relaxed, I feel like I'm in my living room. I let my guard down a little bit. <clears throat> but that, that happened when I was, went to college in Missouri. And when I got there, I took all the speech and drama classes and all of that. And my, my uh, teacher right away as a freshman said, Mickey, you have a, a thick Br Brooklyn accent, he called it. And I said, yeah, I thought everyone else was different. You know, <laughs> he said, you pronounce your or your THs. I said, what do you mean? He said, you say Tawa instead of Tower. You say Pawa instead of Power. And instead of saying that, you say that, D-A-T. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I've been, work, I've been working on that accent for many, many years. So I don't think it's, it's as thick as many other New Yorkers. No, but it's still, it's still very pleasant to my ears. So thank you for that. <laughs> I like it. Um, <laughs> Brian, Terry, and Jessica, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we're in the presence of actually Dr. Mickey Burns. From his, yes, so congratulations on that. And he was also wow. awarded out, most outstanding alumni from his alma mater. I don't know how you found that out, Sherry, <laughs> but uh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> so I, in 2012, I was the keynote speaker at their graduation. To be honest, it was a thrill of a lifetime. And during that, I was awarded, awarded an honorary doctor by the president of the college. So I have it up in my den, and I'm very, very proud of it. And I do use it occasionally. It gets me a better seat on planes, <laughs> better seat in restaurants. Because they figure if somebody uh, chokes on food, as a doctor, I'll be able to do timely <laughs> maneuver. And the same thing on a plane. They never ask you, what kind of doctor are you? <laughs> they, they see doctor. Yeah, you might be an asset. <laughs> so other, other than that, uh, it's just a privilege to, to have been honored that way. Yeah, no, they, they adore you. They sure do love you. And I love them. They, uh, uh, the people out of Missouri Valley changed my life. They gave me an opportunity for college education that I never would have had were it not for them. Uh, um, and when you went back, was aside from the visual changes, and I'm sure the growth of the school and everything, did you have any other kind of epiphanies in returning back to your old stomping grounds when you well, when you were there? It, it, it didn't change a lot, except it got a lot better. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was there, most of the students were from the Midwest, Texas, Missouri, in that area, and New York and New Jersey. When I went back in 2012, and I also was there in, in, in 09, speaking at an entrepreneurial conference. And what I found was now they had students from a hundred different countries there. Wow. wow. And so impressed with that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that the college was moving forward and uh, building a new, this center, that center. And I was there for their football program of which they always have one of the top Division three programs in the country, and it's been like that for 50 or 60 years. So wow. it brought back a lot of fond memories stepping foot on that campus after like 40 years. Sure. And Mickey Burns, isn't it there that you also, until I think it was last season, that you held the record for the coaching wins of the basketball team? Uh, you, 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 <laughs> yeah. you know, when I first got out of college, I wanted to go right into broadcasting. But as I mentioned to you, it was BC before cable. <laughs> and, and there wasn't 500 channels. There was like four or five channels back in 1970, you know, 71, 72. So I went back to New York and started teaching and coaching. And uh, I was fortunate enough to coach a group of kids who were phenomenal. And we ended up being the first team from Staten Island to ever make it to the city championship game. 
uh, back in, I think, 1977, 78. And I'll tell you what, I, people always ask about that team because they consider it the best ever on Staten Island. But what I'm most proud of is that the, all, of all the kids I've coached, and I coached for like 10, 12 years, I can't think of one of them that got into trouble or that, mm-hmm. that didn't make a, a positive future for themselves. Today, they're broadcasters, they're police officers, they're teachers, they're social workers, they're clergy. And that's the thing I, that I'm so proud of and so fond of. Well, and Mickey, you are the essence of the American success story. And as you know, your, your very successful book from the projects to profiles, you know, in America, you can be born and, and grow up anywhere. And you are the role models of so many that it is possible. So you're just such an icon to so many, to so many, you know, demographics and yeah, levels. Well, when you mentioned from the projects to profiles, well, the, what the prize for your viewers, what the projects represent, those are the pr- housing projects in New York City. Mm. And today they have a stigma because they're very low income today. <laughs> and also they have, they're high in crime mm. and, and drugs. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, when I was going through that system, back in the late 50s and early 60s, it was a great place to grow up because there were no drugs yet. There were no guns yet. Uh, what they were were 50 to 100 kids that you could go out and play the sport of the season with every day. So for me, it was a positive experience. So when people hear projects today, they say, oh my God, too bad you had to grow up in that environment. For me, it was a positive one back then. Mm-hmm. Mickey, do you remember your first show on Profiles? When you look back at that show, what was it like putting that together for you? Yeah. Well, that's a great question, Brian. I'll tell you, the first show we did was with Chuck Mangione. He was a trumpet player, had some big hits in the 70s. Yeah. And, 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 And what I remember, I had the idea to do Profiles before that. Uh, because I was doing another show called Special Edition. Mm. It was a news magazine for Time Warner. And in every segment, or in every episode, I used to do a celebrity profile, at which would end up being like four minutes long. So I'd run into the Manhattan and do a... a if Tony Orlando was on Broadway, I would do an interview with him and then run back and do a, edit a four-minute segment for that episode of, prof, uh, of Special Edition, it was called. So, and I was always tell the people on the staff, you know, I, I have a 30 minute interview with Tony Orlando. It's phenomenal. And we can only use four minutes. We should do another show, a long format interview show, call it profiles and give these celebrities a chance to talk about their life and career. So we knew Chuck Mangione was available. He was coming to perform close to where we were. He accepted to do the interview. He said, great. When I tell you, when I saw that first interview, I was blown away. I said, this is so great. You know, I said, I, I'm not sure if people will like, will like it as much as I do, but it was in depth. He talked about his father. He talked about growing up in Rochester. He talked about uh, you know, how he learned playing the horn. He talked about his career. He talked about his drug abuse during his career. And when I saw the final edited version, it blew me away. I said, wow. we got to be, a, this has to be a success, this series. So that, that was, you, you asked a good question, Brian. And the answer was, yeah, I remember it vividly. And I was blown away by what I saw. You know, recently you'd had a, a good friend of ours on Eileen Shapiro. Talk about <laughs> Well, Eileen is great, you know. And, you know, usually I, most of my guests are celebrities with household names. Eileen kind of gives you the backstory of, of what, it, what show business is all about, because she's rubbed elbows with all the greats and uh, people loved her episode. You know, they thought she was full of life and energy and uh, they, they saw a show business from a different perspective and it was, she was great and the show ended up being really great. When you went back into the studio, what was that like for you? Because 
New York is still not opened up. Broadway is still closed. Theaters are closed. I mean, this is, I mean, this is what gives your show another element of stuff because there's not too much to really look forward to, and it's really sad. Yeah, it, it's it's sad now that they're, they're worried about a spike in a recurrence. But I'm in Manhattan all the time. Uh, one of my favorite hotels right near Grand Central Station, uh, the Roosevelt Hotel. Oh, yeah. They were just about to sell celebrate their 100th anniversary. It was the hotel that Guy Lombardo back in the 30s and 40s and 50s used to do uh, New Year's Eve live on television from. Uh, they, they produced tons of movies from it because it's a magnificent state-of-the-art old world hotel. They're closing October 31st, wow. never to open. They just laid off 500 employees. Wow. So it's very depressing, you know, uh, but from our perspective, you know, as hard as it is in New York and everywhere else, we're trying to stay positive and continue to try to create and be positive. Mm -hmm. Not easy. After um, more than 500 guests, is there anyone in particular that you're looking forward to interviewing one day? Well, you know, I, I, I've almost had him two or three times, but on the top of my hit list is Tom Jones. Sir Tom Jones, he just turned 80 years old, you know, and I write about him in my book because I did meet him in 1980 backstage at one of his concerts. And, you know, I was so impressed by him because on stage, he's a wild man, but he's really a very shy and humble guy off, off stage. And I remember asking him because it was just myself, him and, an, and another reporter from uh, Fox News in New York City. And it dawned on me because I realized he works like 300, he went back in 1980, he was working like 320 dates a year. And I said, Tom, you don't have to because your recordings are selling, you had a TV show, but why do you work so hard? You're going to end up hurting your voice or burning out. And he laughed and he said, Mickey, he said, I realize nothing is forever. He said, there's going to come a day and I know it when those seats out there are not going to be filled. He said, I love so much what I do. Until that day comes, I'm going to give it 110% each and every day until, until people don't want me to do it anymore. Interestingly, he just turned 80 and people are still packing in to see him. Well, I was very uh, impressed. You had mentioned him before in the previous interview and, and brought up the fact that he still is very much lively when he performs his voice sounds Incredible. so great and and as a vocalist myself it's not yeah. easy maintaining when you're still you know doing your thing in, in your middle age and then as you get older it doesn't stay the same it doesn't and you really have to work at that so obviously he's he's still just just as focused and and committed because he's his performances and his voice just blow my mind at how how great he still sounds is he still planning on, um, with the progression of, of COVID and all that, is he still planning on doing the November appearance in uh, the city, in New York? I'm not sure. I, I, I would say it's unlikely at this point. What he's yeah. doing right now, he's doing the voice in, in England. They have their version of the voice. And okay. he's, he's one of the panelists. Uh, so every episode, what they do is they end up asking him to sing a standing up and singing a song, and he's he's really the star of the voice in England. Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love Tom. Mickey, I'm all about the interviews that got away. I think for me, James Colburn. I had to interview him in the bathroom, and then like a month later, I was supposed to do a one on one with him, um, and he passed away. Can you remember a couple of people that you well, did, did, never did get, but they were on your list? Well, uh, Pete Rose was one. You know, uh, Pete Rose was uh, was on the show, was, was scheduled for the show. And then like the day or two before, they did a big story in the New York News about how he gambled on baseball and admitted it. And so he canceled last minute uh, because of that. Uh, I had Bonnie Tyler the singer from Wales. What was her big hit, Sherry? I'm going to test you on this one. What was Bonnie? Um, you could, you <laughs> had that. Jesus, tip over time. 
I'm Jessica. <laughs> Call a friend. Um, come on, you're gonna get this. Well, before we get to we're gonna come up with the something with, with the heart. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But she showed up at the studio on the wrong day because of the time difference between mm. Scotland. Um, and the the heart. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hey, Sherry. <laughs> yeah, so she showed up a day early and we weren't even in the studio. And when they called me, I said, no, it's tomorrow. It was their fault, but with her schedule, schedule we couldn't reschedule. Uh, <laughs> another, another, and Frankie Valley is a nice, he got past me uh, because the day, for some reason, he want, this is just before Jersey Boys, was the premiere on, on Broadway. And he wanted to do the show 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and the studio, the Midtown studio, where we do our interviews, usually we did our interviews in the afternoon for 20 years. On this specific day, the fellow who opened the studio overslept. Uh, <laughs> we, so oh, we couldn't no. the studio to interview Frankie Valley. So Frankie Valley and I are standing on Broadway and 72nd Street for an hour shooting the breeze. And we and I would have done it in the restaurant on the corner, but all our equipment was in the studio. Oh. So we we ended up losing Frankie Valley. And that was that uh, um, always bothers me that we didn't get that interview. Man. Wow. And I'm sure there's others that I uh, that I can't remember. Uh, but we got most of them that we wanted. Wow. Uh, we got most, but I wish, you know, so I got to know Frankie Valley really well, but not on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. What's your goal between now and the, and the rest of the year? Mike? Well, it is to, to keep going. I mean, uh, next week I'm interviewing uh, uh, Kim Sledge. Oh. You may one of Sister Sledge, because they just celebrated last year their 40th anniversary. We are family. Wow. Wow. Right? And and they have a, a, a documentary film coming out about their lives and their careers, which spans 50 years. So mm -hmm. I, I can't wait to, to talk. It's one of my favorite movies is yeah. Birdcage with Robin Williams, right? And at the end, the, the finale is we are family that yeah. they dance out of the club. So she's an icon and Sister Sledge is an icon. And I know my viewers will love catching up with her. Mm -hmm. We got time for one more question. So that's, that's a, I'm sorry? I said we got time. Jessica, for uh, Mickey, he was kind of hoping, would you have a moment to do a, a quick song for Mickey? I would love to hear that. Okay. Sing, sing, sing us so a song. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm kind of happy birthday, birthday the other day to um, a guest, and she did it better than Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> that was right. It's a birthday song. <laughs> well, since since um, I, I guess we've been talking. To, I've I told you I was getting a little homesick for um for New York, and I've been wanting to travel and get out there to to see Brian and Terry, and eventually one of these days get up to Canada to see Sherry. So, um, how about a traveling song? How, is that, is, is that good? Paris. All right, go get them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you ever plan to motor west, take the highway, take the way, wait, travel my way, take the highway, that's the best. Get your kicks. Oh, Route 66. <laughs> Very good. I love that cool jazzy, Thanks. too. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of been my, to, to stay in my happy place and to kind of, you know, unwind, relax, and get out of all the all the negative energy, I, I kind of lean towards the jazz jazz well, genre. You know, you I can tell you have a knack for it. Uh, and to, <laughs> Sherry, I got one other thing I wanted to talk to you about which I failed to do on my other rep. Brian, I want to tell you this too, because I think it's information. Where's Sherry? Can she come back for a second? Is she there? Yeah. There you are. <laughs> because, you know, somebody asked me the other day, and they said, and Brian, 
was on it a little bit before. But, you know, what was the key to profile success? Right? And I had no idea. I really didn't. And, and then I remembered we would have these meetings at the network. And every, every so often, they would say, Profiles is the number one rated show on the network. Well, we don't know why. It's no better than this show and that show. How come you're always the number one rated show? And I had, not because of me, I had no idea. The, the Nielsen, Nielsen came out with ratings. And uh, the, the survey was for what is the average age of the New York City television viewer? And I had no idea. What do you think it was? I'm going to quiz you guys. What, what is the average age? And this was seven years ago, about seven years ago. What's the average age of the New York City television viewer? Take 55. a guess. 55, 65. 35? 40? 40. <laughs> I think 35, 36. 35, 36. 35. Well, Sherry, you hit it right on the head. <laughs> five years old. Oh. Today, it's like 60, 61. Oh is the average age. And then they said, oh, now we get it. <laughs> Profiles is showcasing uh, programming that people who are still watching television want to see. And it was done by oh, accident. Geez. We never thought it out. We never thought about it. It was just, that's what we did. And the numbers indicated that we were doing something right by accident, hmm. because we wow. were showing the people who were still watching television, they wanted to catch up with Joan Rivers. They wanted to catch up with Tony Orlando. They want to catch up with Engelbert Humperdinck. So uh, the success, any success that we've had on Profiles is basically evolved by accident. I just wanted and to throw that. And Mickey Burns, I'm sure. <laughs> and Mickey, we got to thank but you because we got to have a hard out. So I want to thank Mickey Burns. Obviously, check out his book. I got to thank Sherry Nelson for all that. Jessica, Terry, this is Movie Reviews and More. We will see you next week. I know, if you see someone who went out of smile, give them one of your Mickey.